Hey, Redcon Trader here, and welcome back to Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader. As today, the void has grown ever more shadowed. That's right, we've got the new DLC installed and ready to go. Though, uh, sadly, we did miss any special new events they had during Act 1. We're just jumping in with Act 2, hopefully it won't be too disorienting. Though I will say, right off the bat, upon entering our bridge... I did notice we seem to have a whole crazy cast of new characters hanging about. Which I suppose means the most logical place to start is by chatting them up. That'll help give us context as to what we may have missed and, uh, and what the future may hold. Not to mention valuable context for any events these characters will inevitably be involved in. Jocasta Sourback is the very picture of discipline. Her uniform is exquisitely pressed, her armor is polished, and her posture is imposing and rigid. The only flaw in her immaculate appearance is the heavy enforcer's maul, which is worn and battered from frequent use. She salutes you with a practiced motion. Greetings, Lord Captain. Jocasta Sourback. Clearly we've met before, but uh, tell me about yourself. I come from the noble Sourback family of the capital world of Dargonis. I dare say that our house is renowned for its loyalty and strict adherence to the law, and the members of my family have been your faithful enforcers for centuries. I am honored to be the sixth master-at-arms named Sourback to serve on this ship. Jocasta speaks the words with unmistakable pride. So why, uh, why serve here and not, not bask in the luxuries of Dargonis? Because of my cousin Macarius, a furious crease appears between her brows. I cannot stand him, but the feeling is mutual. We can hardly be in the same room together, so I jumped at the opportunity to become your enforcer. I should thank my obnoxious cousin for nudging me toward the best decision of my life. I serve you with all my heart, and wish for no other fate than this one. Okay, okay, sure, yeah, uh, laying it on a bit thick, but I appreciate that, I guess. I notice you're wearing Imperial Navy armor. I was an Astra Militarum man myself. Where'd you serve? I inherited it from the previous Master at Arms. Like the esteemed Seneschal, he left the Navy to serve the Lady Theodora. He brought quite a few officers with him and established a tradition. Upon the death or resignation of an enforcer... His or her armor would be passed on to a fellow officer who had distinguished themselves in the course of their duties. I was awarded armor in this way in my time, and upon the death of my predecessor, I inherited his personal armor. Oh, okay, so you're not actually former Imperial Navy, you're just cosplaying as one gotcha. Right, well, uh... Tell me, Jocasta, in the long, long time we've clearly known each other since the beginning of our adventures, uh, what is your opinion of my performance thus far? Share with me your personal take on the trials and tribulations that we have thus far endured side by side. I do not doubt the astuteness of your decisions, but beyond that, I am impressed with you. I have heard about the brutal punishments that you have endured, Lord Captain. She looks away, but before she does so, you notice a strange spark in her eyes. Your tenacity deserves admiration. Oh, interesting. Okay, so that's an actual nod to her backstory. That's actually kind of funny, because I just commented a, a couple of episodes ago that it felt like they forgot about that. There is fire in the black depths of her gaze. If she could, she would devour you whole with her sidelong glances. Master at Arms Sourback, I cannot help but notice your most peculiar expression. Uh, it would seem to me that you hold me in more than simple admiration. Then what about awe? She stares at your neck, right at the scar peeking up from under your collar. Her pupils dilate and she licks her lips involuntarily. Thinking about what you have suffered leaves me trembling. 
Okay, well, Jocasta, it was a pleasure meeting you. I'm, I'm going to walk away and never come back. Um, is what I would say if it were an option. I guess I will politely ask you to refrain from being a complete freak, if at all possible. Of course, Lord Captain. She forces herself to look at you again. And this time, you see only cold impassivity in her eyes. Yeah, I guess that's better. Thanks. So, uh, what, what do you think about your fellow officers? I do not trust them. But I do not trust anyone. Mistress Toloman has too much power, and will surely be tempted to start deciding for herself what information to share with the crew on your behalf, and what to withhold. Ravor is closely intertwined with the ship's systems, which opens up plenty of opportunities for sabotage. He must be watched. As for Danrock, forgive me, but a man of his size and habits cannot help but steal. Hmm. Nothing on the new guys? I mean, there's plenty of other new officers scattered around the decks now. Also, I uh, notice you declined to mention Abelard. The Seneschal is a model of competence and fidelity, and all the officers and enforcers look up to him with gratitude. A grimace of fierce devotion takes hold of Sourback's face, before she abruptly grits her teeth and continues. It is all the more distressing to see that the years have not been kind to the deeply respected Master Worsurian. Soon there will be no rejuvenate treatment that can save him from the mistakes inherent in such advanced age. But we are ever watchful, and will be there to steady the trembling hand of the honored veteran, if need be. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get along, Jocasta, but uh, please, tell me more of your service. I mean, clearly you didn't serve in the Imperial Navy, so where did you serve? What life experience has prepared you for so lofty a position on a rogue trader ship? I am ready to answer any questions, Lord Captain. Okay, let's uh, start with your duties. What exactly is your job here? I am responsible for upholding safety and order aboard the ship. Guard duties, patrols, finding and punishing troublemakers. In addition, my enforcers ensure that the crew follow all directives and carry out their tasks properly. As they say in my family, a servant who shows disobedience today prepares a riot tomorrow. Sure, sure, but there are thousands upon thousands of people on this ship. How do you keep them under control? Two words, Lord Captain. Suppression and fear. The base nature of the rabble cries for an iron grip, lest they give in to their animal urges. We have many well-tested measures to prevent it. Random night searches, preventive interrogations, corporal punishment, and executions. Of course, the laws of the ship equally apply to the officers. We eradicate the canker of insubordination wherever we find it, without mercy. Yeah, yeah, I feel like my instincts were right here. We're not going to get along. Though this does certainly explain a few things about how my ship's being run. All right, well, Jocasta, uh, hopefully you managed the job better than the last guy. Uh, Mort, I think? Man, poor Mort. I feel like I would have gotten along with him a little better. You can be sure of that. He was a fine enforcer, but suffered from the fatal flaw of trusting his associates. I myself lack that weakness, and trust no one except you, Lord Captain. Right, right, yeah, sure. Uh, complete lack of trust in your peers. That does seem like a healthy work environment to foster. Well, Jocasta, it's, uh, it's been terrible. Uh, I am very sorry I talked to you. And I wish you nothing but the worst. Hey, Kaiser. I can't imagine that's going to end well. But uh, at, at the same time, it is nice to finally meet one of the Sourbacks. Not, I suppose, that we've actually met any Goprocks either. Governor Goprock was dead by the time we actually got to Kiaba Gamma. Wonder if we've got one of them kicking around now. I did notice we have a new exit from our bridge, so presumably we have yet more... 
new NPCs lurking just off screen. A man of indeterminate age bows his head. His robes are spotless and his rigid collar constricts his throat. The unsettling smell of medicine hangs in the air, and the man's pale eyes look bleached. Greetings, your lordship. Your surgeon Majoris is at your service. Well, greetings, Forius. It's a pleasure to meet you. I notice you are not important enough to have your own portrait, like Sourbag did. Please tell me about your uh, duties here on my ship. My job is to save lives. Heal wounded officers, develop vaccines for onboard epidemics, discover new methods of healing. However, I spend most watches listening to patients about their many qualms, managing the junior Medicaid officers and dividing the afflicted into those who matter and those who do not. A rather irritating addition to my duties as Surgeon Majoris. Right, right, so not really big on bedside manner, I take it. Yeah, that tracks. Compassion has nothing to do with the healer's trade. I prefer conversing with diseases rather than their carriers. Patients are... aggravating. Hmm. That certainly doesn't sound like something a Nurgle worshipper would say. You mentioned new methods. Please tell me about them. I'm sure they won't at all be horrifying. There are many. I am ever in search of solutions to dangerous afflictions. My latest work involved studying a particularly lethal disease that devours the person's flesh and skin. It has already claimed a dozen lives, but their deaths were not in vain. I have learned much about the enemy, and the vaccine will soon be ready for testing. Okay, that's not nearly as nightmare-inducing as I feared. I hope I have satisfied your curiosity. On that particular subject, yes. But uh, please tell me, Phoreus, uh, how did you come to serve on my ship? I was the master healer on a world that belongs to the Corda dynasty. I had managed to cure someone who was considered doomed, not because of their illness, but because a certain self-important priest had tried to cure them with a prayer and failed. After I put him to shame, he started spreading rumors that I owed my skill to the influence of the ruinous powers. I sought refuge under Lady Theodora, who expressed an appreciation for my talents and welcomed me and my family on her ship. Okay, interesting. So, Theodora poached you from House Corda. Just to, just to cover my bases, you're not actually a heretic, right? Not to cast dispersions, I'm just doing my due diligence. His colorless eyes flash indignantly. My expertise is the result of hard work and accumulated wisdom, not some paltry sorcery. I employ my craft to save his children. That should serve as better proof of my innocence than any show of piety. Fair enough. I certainly can't argue with that. So you're really telling me that House Cordo would have punished you for being too good at your job? You teach a man to read, you raise a bright heretic. I believe was one of the favorite local sayings. As for demonstrating the superiority of knowledge over the advice of holy ecclesiarchs, well, that kind of defiance was sure to put my life at risk. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. Naturally, House Corda still has need of people like me, educated and capable of intellectual thought. However, anyone who is permitted to learn does so under strict supervision. I have heard Lady Incendia's ship has a dedicated compartment for sages and keepers of knowledge that more resembles a prison than a librarian. Yeah, that certainly does match with what we've heard about her. It's actually kind of funny because it, uh, it does feel like it sets the cannon path for Rogue Trader to Iconoclast, since our two rival Rogue Traders are dogmatic and heretical to self-destructive extremes. Well, uh, Lettered, what can you tell me about our crew's health? I hope no one's down with a sickness. Ooh-ah-ah-ah. Uh, uh, uh. 
Are you interested in a general report on the ship as a whole, or in hearing about how your immediate subordinates are faring? Both, actually, but uh, let's start with the general crew. I am currently not aware of any epidemics or other large-scale threats to the lives of the crew, or anything more serious than normal, at least. Minor outbreaks are part of the natural decline process. The Medicae are occupied with treating both industrial and combat injuries, as well as dealing with sporadically occurring ailments. Good to know. And what of your fellow officers? Anything I should know there? The Master Helmsman headaches caused by his faulty implants, the High Factotum's occasional indigestion, the Master at Arms combat wounds that can hardly be considered life threatening. Boreas folds a finger dismissively for every officer he mentions. Vapid cases that I am obligated to manage as Surgeon Majoris. At least the Infernus Master does not waste my time and simply comes to pick up ointments for his burns. Right, well, good to know. Was there anything else to discuss? No, no, I think I've heard plenty. Thank you, Boreas. Uh, it has been a pleasure. I do feel like you're exactly the sort of bridge crew that Valen would actually appreciate. Now let's chat up this guy, Einrich Montag. The Infernus Master nonchalantly lights a low stick from a thermal cutter and spreads his arms in a welcoming gesture. Heinrich Montag, at your service. He smells of cinders and low, his face is sooty, and his belt is laden with a number of heavy tools. You would have taken him for a laborer if it weren't for the greasy and ragged officer's uniform. Montag, it's good to see you again after all the adventures we've clearly had together. But uh, refresh my memory, who, who exactly are you and what do you do here? I'm just a humble laborer in charge of putting out fires and dealing with emergencies. But everyone calls me the Infernus Master. I guess this is because I answer for them with my life. With your life, you say? That's right. Picture flames roaring, all the ship systems have failed, including the artificial gravity. You can't make out anything because of the red-hot debris, and you know an explosion is coming. It's a nightmare, but it's your job to evacuate the panicked crew, eliminate the cause of the fire, and get the compartment back in working order. Of course, the job description doesn't allow me to risk my life now. He smiles sadly. It's all about management these days, sending the boys and girls into the fire. But it's all nonsense, and if the going gets tough... I won't leave them there alone. Well, hey, I can certainly appreciate that. So tell me, what kind of uh, emergencies do you normally deal with on a ship like this where nothing ever goes wrong and no one ever dies? Oh, there are uh, plenty. Accidents due to external factors, for example. Hits from enemy guns or collusions with hollow objects like the wreckage of other ships. There are plenty of internal causes as well, from system malfunctions and short circuits to problematic cargo. A couple years ago, something blew up in the hold, nearly burned it to a crisp. And then there's sabotage. That Voitveer snake did a lot of damage to the ship. Right, yeah, I guess that did happen, didn't it? I'm guessing that's where we would have met you for the first time. So you're just a laborer, huh? Then why aren't you off laboring somewhere? The simple answer is because nothing's on fire. As head of the Infernus Guild, I'm mired in the officer's routine of reports and discussions. There are several compartment upgrades and refurbishments on the agenda right now, and I have to make sure that fire safety protocols are followed everywhere. Rest assured, I'll scurry back to the technical base to do manual labor as soon as all the paperwork's done. That is also fair. Mind if I uh, ask a few more questions? Ready to answer them all. I like you, Montag. 
you know, aside from Jay, I feel like you're the the second most relaxed person on this bridge. Perhaps because I live under the constant threat of agonizing death by fire, I have a repressed, uh, what's the word? Self-preservation instinct? Or maybe I just relish every minute I get to breathe low smoke instead of cinders. I humbly apologize for my manners, Lord Captain. Heinrich continues to smile without a shred of embarrassment. Oh, no, don't, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's actually a refreshing change of pace. You know, I'd, uh, I'd actually join you with the low if... If not for the uh, delicate balance of my internal prosthetics. Honestly, though, uh, it is it is nice to just be able to talk to someone as a person. Not as if I'm some, some object of borderline worship. I'm glad you feel that way. Life is too short to waste it on ceremonies. It's better to present yourself as you are. Immediately. Well, I can certainly appreciate your straightforward nature. So tell me, my friend, how did you uh, come to serve aboard my ship? Oh, uh, not in the usual way. My ancestors wronged yours and were appointed Inferni as a result. Hard labor, deadly risks, plenty of opportunities to atone. Those criminals have been dead for generations, but we're still serving their time. Maybe we'll find redemption one day. Oh. Well, that's kind of... Sorry about that. Uh, so tell me more about your guild? Question mark? Sure. What interests you the most? Our duty, our state-of-the-art equipment, or our vibrant traditions? How's the, uh, how does the guild work exactly? The Infernus Service is split into different brigades according to duties. The heart of the guild are, of course, our liquidators. Tough guys with nerves of steel who put out fires and pull people from the flames. Others are repairmen dealing with problems like jammed doors, fuel leaks, or broken vents. And then there's the walking inspectors who check the decks to make sure that nothing is blocking any passages or access to communication lines. And what about that uh, state-of-the-art equipment you mentioned? That sounds intriguing. The Infernus Master smiles guiltily. Uh, that was a bit of a stretch. <laughs> I'm sorry. There is no state-of-the-art equipment. The risks of ruining it in a fire are too great. We get by using human resources and the most common items available. Respirators, fire extinguishers, and flame-retardant uniforms. Let's face it, the lives of the Inferni are not worth much. It's more important that we save the machines and minimize damage to the ship. Well, don't sell yourself short. I mean, your meat body may not be much, but... It's gotten you this far. So how about those traditions? We have plenty of those, like the reminders. Heinrich rolls up his sleeve, revealing a tattoo inscribed over an old burn mark. When you survive a particularly hopeless accident, you get a tattoo on your scar. You can always tell an experienced Infernus by their ink. It's like a badge of honor of sorts. I see. Don't show that to Sourback over there. She'll get really weird about it. But please, tell me more. He points to a tattoo on his right forearm. This one is from the time plasma leaked from the outer aft circuit. Imagine yourself clinging to the hull outside, thermal cutter in one hand and a magnetic clamp in the other. As your flames burst from the breach, the kind that can incinerate you in a second. All that separates you from death is a flimsy rope and a void suit more ancient than Holy Terra. And yet, the price I paid was nothing compared to my comrades. He slowly moves the augmented fingers of his right hand. Oh yeah, look at that. Also, don't think it's escaped me that you are one of the new characters who's apparently important enough to actually get a portrait. That does feel a bit telling. As for this one, the look he directs at his left hand is full of bitterness. I got this one in the ammo depot where my wife, Elsinora, died. There was a fire, and the flames were getting close to the ammunition. And I don't mean auto-gun rounds. These were macro-cannon shells. We put out the fire as best we could, but we were losing. Suddenly, Elsie took my hand, kissed me, and then ran straight into the blaze and activated the emergency blast door. We stayed outside while she vented the compartment. 
Heinrich gives a tender smile, gazing at the smoke. It was quite a story. I'm sorry for your loss, Montag. It sounds like she was quite a woman. He nods gratefully and takes another puff. Well, Montag, it, uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Anything else we should talk about? No, no, I didn't mean to give you the third degree. I'll, uh, I'll leave you be. Never let your fire go out, Lord Captain. I mean, no. Heinrich hurriedly waves his hands. That's just a stupid little guild in joke. Seriously, if you see an Infernus next to a naked flame, run. Will do. Thanks, bud. Interesting, interesting. I like, uh, I like Heinrich. I like Forius, too. I think it's really just Sourbeck who kind of got off on a sour note, and that's, well, for any number of reasons, not the least of which is her thinly veiled sociopathic tendencies. But, you know, I suppose that's the sort of person who would be attracted to that sort of position. I also do find it very telling that the only characters thus far who are portrait worthy are the one representing the common laborers of the ship, the downtrodden, and the character who is most in charge of keeping them well-trodden. Given the nature of that early Abelard event, I imagine we're going to see more events that kind of build off of that. Though I am at a bit of a loss as to where the whole death cult angle will come into play. Oh, interesting. We have two new locations. We have the the Void Ship Shrine and the Astropathic Chapel. And apparently we go in with a six-man party? That feels weird. Of course, two new locations also implies lots more chatter ahead of us. Oh yeah, look at that. Three more characters to talk to. Two initiates and... Our High Confessor. As well as an assortment of other random things to look at. I will say, it's all been pretty interesting so far. Confessor Adelbert. Who does not get a portrait. Noted. Confessor Adelbert, a plump, rosy-cheeked old man, is lighting candles taking his time with each. Glints of fire dance on his heavy golden aquila and on his sky-blue eyes as he addresses you, smiling. The Emperor protects your lordship. Are you here to pray, or have mundane matters brought you to me? There is an incredible profound quality to his voice, and he speaks with mesmerizing timber. I'm just going around reminiscing with all my old, long-standing crew members about how they first came to the ship. Yourself, for example. Oh, I am the ship's confessor, your lordship. No vessel that abides by the Imperium's laws can sail the void without a spiritual guide. Even a smaller-sized ship that does not have a member of the Ecclesiarchy on board entrusts all matters of faith to a layperson who is a staunch adherent of the creed. A rogue trader's flagship naturally is expected to have a confessor who comes from a line of his reverent servants. I am such a one. I am entrusted with caring for the reliquary chapel in the dynastic crypt. I also conduct liturgies, consecrate the ship's bays, and strengthen the crew's hearts whenever a dark hour is upon us, lest any among them falter in the face of the horrors lurking in the darkness, and fail in their duty. Right, and a fine job you're doing of it. Uh, tell me about this dynastic crypt. I thought we shot Theodora into space. Every rogue trader takes care to maintain an appropriate place of repose on board their flagship, for their capital may change with the passing of centuries, but the vessel of the Emperor's anointed serves them for millennia. It is more than just a symbol of the dynasty's authority. It is the source of its power. The Lord Captain's seat in the void, whence they reign over their many lands. The Von Valancius crypt is where rogue traders and their most loyal servants are laid to rest, 
As the ship's confessor, I perform the rites of burial and remembrance for these honored dead. Adelbert lets out a heavy sigh. It never occurred to this old man that he might have to send Lady Theodora on her final journey. But all is the Emperor's will. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, he is a convenient scapegoat for everything and all things that happen forever. So what about this place? I had no idea I had such a majestic shrine on board my ship. Adelbert smiles warmly at you. I could talk about the Reliquary Chapel for hours. I'd really rather you didn't, but uh, I'm assuming this obviously isn't the only shrine on the ship. Why no, there are multiple sancta on every deck, where your subjects pray fervently, and the clergy keeps a close watch on the firmness of their faith. This, on the other hand, he gestures around at the glittering reliquary, is the holiest of holy places, where only the noblest among your servants are permitted to set foot. Oh, I mean, that hardly seems fair, the Emperor accepts each and every one of us as long as we do our parts, right? So it's it's only fair that the rest of the crew gets to pay pilgrimage to this holiest of holy places. Adelbert's eyebrows arch upward. Truly a most generous and gracious gesture, your lordship. I'll arrange for commoners who have distinguished themselves in their service to be allowed in here. An event like that will fill them with fervor and they will pass down the memory of what they have seen to their offspring. Cool. Glad to hear it. So where'd all this stuff come from, anyway? Every relic we have here was either arduously tracked down by your ancestors, captured in battle against the faithless, or received as a gift for glorious deeds. A show of loyalty to the Emperor that speaks for itself, does it not? He makes no effort to conceal his pride. For our part, we keep the precious relics intact and undisturbed as we conduct liturgies and perform rites. Initiate Zeke is especially diligent in his care for the relics. Though he is of common stock, he earned his position through dedication and piety. Ah, thus explaining the purpose of one of our two mysterious initiates, gotcha. If you have any other questions, I will do my best to answer them. Yeah, you know what? Uh, as long as I'm here, I might as well hear the Imperium's tenets. You know, obviously I know them by heart and live by them every day, but uh, it's still good to get the occasional refresher. In a voice brimming with solemnity, Adelbart begins. Every man and woman has their place in the order he created and his order must be followed, and the will of one superior is obeyed. Beware of witches, for they have been stained by the warp. Persecute mutants, for they are perversions of the human form. And hate the accursed Xenos. Oh, right, yeah, you know, for some reason I was expecting more than that, but sure. Just uh, real quick, though, why the persecution against witches and or warlocks? Do they not serve a vital function in the Imperium? You are right. Without the astropaths, we are deaf and blind, and there are many other psychers laboring for the good of humanity. That is their place within the Emperor's design. But only those among them who accept his light, and have been authorized. Adira scoffs contemptuously. For once in your life, you could just admit that it doesn't take a tongue calloused from prayer to handle the warp's dangers. And you say to uh, persecute mutants, but what of the navigators? Do they also not serve a vital function for the Imperium? The Nevis nobility are different from most humans, but their differences are a blessing. They are noble servants of the Imperium who help humanity expand its galactic domain. Do you not see that as a higher purpose that pleases the Emperor? It is a pleasure to hear that, unlike the ignorant rabble, you give due acknowledgement to the greatness of our deeds, Confessor. Look, I'm, I'm just saying I feel like maybe some other mutants could find ways to please the Emperor if we weren't persecuting them all the time, but, you know. Uh, well, what about the Omnissiah? Where does he fit into all this? He, he's also the Emperor? 
Most certainly. Different likenesses of the Emperor and ways of worshipping him can be found across the Imperium's worlds. But we all believe in the One. For the purposes of optimizing the present exchange, I suggest regarding this statement as true. For a competent answer to the question, I recommend addressing this unit as a member of the Adeptus Mechanicus clergy. So obviously these tenets aren't absolute. It, it seems like pretty much any of them can be violated. As long as it's for the betterment of the Imperium. My, my warrant of trade, for example. Violated? Those are not to be conceived of as violations. A rogue trader's privileges come with a duty. The duty to expand the bounds of human influence. If the rogue trader must take responsibility for unorthodox solutions or actions in the course of performing that duty, then so be it. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, it all makes sense now. Thank you. I don't know what I was thinking. I appreciate your time, Adalbert. As your lordship wishes. I will say, though, as far as uh, ranking members of the Ecclesiarchy go, you are, you are surprisingly inoffensive. It's actually kind of a, a refreshing change of pace from the others I've encountered throughout my travels. Adalbert laughs good-naturedly. A fair observation. Everyone knows that the clergy must maintain a stern appearance to inspire fear and awe in their flock. His mirth fades, giving way to a pensive gravitas. The truth is that my clan and I experienced great hardship. I cannot explain how it is I am standing before you now except by his will. How could one be anything but joyful knowing they were saved by the Emperor? Oh, well, I mean, I'm glad he could save you, but what happened to your clan? I was scarcely more than a child when the malady struck our cabins. First would come the fever, then the unlucky victim would start retching blood. After that, they would melt away like a candle. Only the youngest survived, myself among them. He smiles feebly. But now my family is growing, and I am grateful for each new life that replaces one lost. Well, I'm... Very sorry it took that kind of trauma to instill within you the humility and enjoyment of life that is so rare amongst the Ecclesiarchy, but, um, I like it. Keep it up. Of course, your lordship. So, just out of curiosity, was my, um, was my predecessor a pious woman? Your predecessor always had due concern for the reliquary's maintenance and its needs, and under her rule, faith occupied its proper place on this ship. Adalbert gives you a diplomatic smile. Right, so that's that's a no. Gotcha, that certainly tracks. Um, tell me, Adalbert, does the Imperium maintain a confessional... It seems to me that would be a valuable way to gather actionable intel. Ours is a throne-fearing flock that regularly leaves Vox recordings in the Shrine Confessional, housed in the eastern part of the Reliquary. This allows us to maintain constant watch for any heretical tendencies. We can observe the earnesty with which our parishioners render their duties, as well as any dangerous dissent brewing in their minds. Initiate Clotus is responsible for sorting the confessions. He would be honored to offer you access to the confessional cogitator. Ah, and that's our other initiate. Okay, so one for reliquaries, one for confessions. Gotcha. Thank you, Padre. I appreciate your time. May the Emperor's blessings be with you, your lordship. And you as well. All right, let's touch all the things. The Aquila Anima, a fragment of the Cathedral of Eternal Redemption. Brought from the Shrine World of Solus Six, 
now lost. You recite a prayer, the one you remember best. Okay, uh, well, that's done. On we, on we go. The Imperium Invictum, the shards of an unknown Angevin Crusade warrior's twin blades, returned from pirate captivity by the grace of the Emperor. My house would be proud of me. Among the antique weapons, you spot them all known as the Ferrum Fatum. Legend has it that its head split when it cracked open the skull of the loathsome daemon, Brenazar the Flayer. Ah, okay, so all this stuff is broken. That's, that's why we're not putting it to more practical use. The Rex Regalia, the partially restored blade of Zathodus the Earnest a missionary who decimated the abominable Xenos and fell in a deathly battle against the unrighteous. Cool, cool. An ancient-looking chainsword without a fuel engine rests on the weapon rack. The shape of its teeth make you think of the Ulma Universalis, a pattern from the Angevin Crusade era. I always have a backup plan. The skeleton inside the sarcophagus is holding a spherical object, gleaming with gold. Oh yeah, that is a skeleton, huh. The broad-shouldered young priest makes the sign of the Aquila. The Emperor protects your lordship. How may I be of service? Well, that depends. Who are you? Initiate Zeek, your lordship. I recite prayers and help Confessor Adelbert with the rites. I see. And uh, what's up with this sarcophagi? The initiate looks over at the sarcophagus. The skeleton within is clutching an orb made up of many tightly fitted hoops covered in glyphs. A mysterious object, but undeniably a holy one. It was donated by a group of pilgrims who studied the legacy of the great missionary Nadine Alinikov. They believed there was something inside that only someone truly righteous was meant to have. One of the pilgrims was so desperate to witness the moment of the orb's opening that they bequeathed their body to us. So you're telling me there are unplundered riches in that there sarcophagus? And no one, no one has any idea how to open this mysterious orb? One of your predecessors was the last to attempt solving this relic's mystery. It happened a long time ago, before Lady Theodora was born. That's all I know. Huh, and no one's ever just tried taking it apart? To damage a sacred relic is an unthinkable crime, and to use force to bypass the test of wisdom and faith it contains is terrible blasphemy. Right, right, of course, you are absolutely correct. Uh, unrelated, would you mind handing me the orb? I'd, I'd love to take a closer look at it. The initiate opens the lock and hands you the orb. Someone has already moved the hoops around, trying to arrange the letters into meaningful sentences. It will only take a few more rotations for the orb to split cleanly into four parts, each with its own question. The answers should presumably be formed using adjoining hoops. Go on then, ask me your questions, Bridgekeeper. I am not afraid. My light reaches everywhere. The greedy will see me in gold. The scholars in humanity's cradle. But only the righteous will see me within their souls. Okay, well, I mean, that's gotta be the Emperor, right? For better or worse, something clicks inside the orb. Okay, I am slightly less certain now. Uh, ask me your second question. I am within every human, and my loss is feared. For without me comes the end. But give me to the Emperor, and you will be eternal. I mean, I'm gonna say life covers most of those bases? Though it could also easily be soul. 
Another soft click comes from inside the orb. Cool, cool. Next. I am poison. I am perdition. I am disgrace. Burn me down, eradicate me, or perish. Rejected by the Emperor. Your sharp mind quickly scours the recesses of your memory for any fragments of Nadine Alinikov's sermons. You recall that she mercilessly denounced the weakness of those who have faith in the Emperor, but are incapable of translating that faith into deeds. She must have despised this shortcoming of the soul more than any other. Okay, so... Weakness, then. Yeah, that's the only word there that matches any of our options, so... Weakness? With a click, the hoop settles in place. Cool. And the final question? In your body, mind, and soul, you must possess me. I am no mere absence of stains. I bring you closer to him. Duty? I mean, that's what makes the Imperium work, right? We're all doing our part? The hoops shift and return to their previous arrangement. You will have to start over. Oh, darn. Okay, so there's no actual penalty for failure? Zeke, buddy, I gotta say, um, if there's only four questions with four potential answers to each one, I feel like someone could have probably brute forced this by now. I will say, though, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that they weren't, like, actual riddles. That would have been fun. I do enjoy a good riddle. Or uh, even if they had just scattered clues amongst the other displays. That's usually how these things work. All right, well, give me a sec. I'm just going to brute force this. And got it. Throne. Blood. Weakness. And... Purity. The orb comes alive. Its hoops shift around with alarming speed, coming together and folding into each other until the orb opens completely, laying its treasure bare. The initiate stares at the relic in your hands, stunned. How strange and exciting it is to behold the holy object that it has lain hidden from the eye for so many years. Truly, it is a great day upon which the rogue trader himself has revealed the legacy of great missionaries to us all. Yeah, don't mention it. Took me like, I don't know, five minutes. So what great treasure have we unveiled? What holy relic was so sacred it had to be hidden away for centuries? Missionary Oath. Once per combat, if the wearer does not use any abilities during their turn... They can end their turn immediately to grant all adjacent allies an extra turn with one action point. Well, that is certainly a thing. I mean, five minutes work. I can't really be mad. All hail the rogue trader who solved the mystery of the sacred relic. Ah, shucks, kid. It was nothing. Here's your empty puzzle sphere back to keep the dead pilgrim company, I guess. Hey, what's up? How you doing? Just hanging out? That's cool. A power mall rests inside the glass. The inscription on the reliquary reads, I am wrath. I am the cleansing. Whosoever wields me walks in the footsteps of Furia. Neat. Anyway. Initiate Clotus. The machine in the Shrine Confessional emits a low hum as it processes the congregant's box recordings. 
A lanky initiate is leaning over the cogitator, an expression of extreme mental effort on his face, his fish-like round eyes peering into the screen. Grant me understanding, master. Grant me wisdom. He winces as you approach. Your lordship? How can I be of service? That depends. Who are you and what do you do? I am Clotus, junior cleric. I sort recordings from the Shrine Confessional to pass on to the higher-ranking clergy. I see. So, tell me more of this miraculous machine. Our parishioners come here to repent, to share their innermost thoughts and observations of their neighbors. The sacred machine records all confessions and alters the voice beyond recognition. Ah, okay, so there is some degree of anonymity. So there's no way to attach a confession to an individual? There is not. Clotus shakes his head resolutely. That would undermine the usefulness of it. The first prototype wasn't anonymous, so those confessions might as well have been carbon copies of each other. Everyone was impeccably diligent and pious and whatnot. But as soon as the machine spirit started keeping the name secret... The parishioners opened up. Yeah, yeah, funny how uh, lack of actual consequences suddenly makes us all brave enough to speak our minds. Well, uh, keep up the good work. I will endeavor to do so, your lordship. I uh, had other questions, apparently. Of course, what does your lordship wish to know? Well, it appeared that you had a look of grave consternation upon your face upon my approach. Uh, what troubles you, so? Another puzzle, mayhaps? Nothing escapes your lordship's notice. As it so happens, I am struggling to categorize three rather uh, peculiar confessions. I wouldn't have dared tell you about them, but uh, I think they may have been left by senior officers. Which would make this a matter of the highest order, one that is far beyond my meager understanding. These confessions, you see, are, are far from being examples of pious conformity. I dread the very thought of dissent or heresy poisoning the minds of some of the most eminent members of the crew. But I cannot change what I heard. He bows his head in reverence. I cannot share this with anyone but the Emperor's anointed, nor can I allow anyone but your lordship to listen to these messages, protected by the secrecy of confession. Well, hold on. If, if they're anonymous, then how do you know that they came from senior officers? These parishioners are well-spoken, meaning they are used to addressing an audience. Perhaps they issue orders and are vested with power. And, well, after categorizing so many confessions, I have learned to notice the subtle differences between them. I see. How very astute of you. Well, you've certainly uh, piqued my interest. Let's hear them. The initiate steps aside, putting the cogitator at your disposal. Recording 17FL2. Alleged descent. Impious doubt. Those aren't words. One question has troubled me for years. Why are some destined to perish in the warp, while others must go on living and preserve the memory of the dead? Worthier and more luminous souls have been lost, and yet I am still here. Light static is distorting the recording, but you are confident that the speaker is male. Honestly, that could easily be the Confessor. Or perhaps the Infernus Master? Recording 134DU, Alleged Theft of Ship Property. The orphans on the ship have already been provided with the bare essentials, but every so often I consider increasing their rations and ordering more sets of clothes for them. That will not replace the families they lost, but it will improve their lives somewhat, especially given that the ship has enough resources to cover that comparably trivial expense. Despite the poor sound quality, you determine the voice to be male. Uh, honestly, if they hadn't mentioned uh, the fact that it was a male speaker, I might have otherwise guessed Argenta. 
You have heard the bridge officers gossiping that the High Factotum has taken personal charge of the orphans. Well, good for him. That's actually really sweet. Recording 502MM, alleged coded message, irreverence, question mark? Lop-eared kleppas display a high degree of socialization both among their kind and toward their owners. These animals adjust well to avoid chips' lower gravity, since it is similar to their homeworld's conditions. Lop-eared kleppa meat is edible should necessity demand it. The voice sounds muffled as though from behind a thick layer of glass, but is unmistakably a woman's. Okay, well that one's just weird. Though it did imply it might be a coded message. Thick glass. The initiate looks at you, intrigued, but does not say a word. All right, Clotus, you have my attention. I, I am intrigued. I'll, uh, I'll look into this. I suppose these confessions truly are special if your lordship is giving them his personal attention. The initiate bows deeply. Never would I have imagined the rogue traitor himself coming to my aid. Yeah, well, you know. I never could resist a side quest, so I'll see what I can do. And it seems like we actually have to confront the people who made the confessions. Which will be slightly awkward, but honestly, in the case of, like, Danrock, it sounds like it'll... It'll be a nice opportunity for charity. Also a deep violation of their assumption of privacy when making confession, but, you know. Oh, hello there. Oh ho, pressure plates. I see, I see. And now we know why they had us come in here with a full party. Oh, that one didn't trigger a light. In fact, it turned off the one light we illuminated. So what am I missing? Oh, we have a pressure plate near the front. We have possible pressure plates we haven't triggered on the sides here. We have the conspicuous skull at center. Oh, wait, that's an eye. Okay. That's an I. That's an F. Oh, do we have to spell Furia? That would be five letters. Yes, that's that's exactly what we have to do. Gotcha. The question being, where are the rest of our letters? We have an A up front. We have an F. We have an I. So we are missing a U and an R. Do we have another switch around here somewhere that'll uncover these last two plates? Hmm. What am I missing? Oh, wait, right, okay, well, scratch that, turns out it was right in front of me. There's our R, and there's our U. What is it? All right, one sec, let me just crack the case. Hey, Bert, I, uh, I'm going to take this reliquary. I hope that's cool. Unquenchable Fury. 
Whenever the small pushes the target, the distance of the push is increased by plus five cells. And the collusion damage is increased by plus 50%. Okay, the uh, actual damage is pretty trivial, but that is hilarious and I am definitely using it. I do think these items are somewhat deliberately underwhelming because the intent is for you to find them much earlier in the game. I imagine this area and its hidden prizes would be accessible very early on, like possibly as far back as Act 1. So technically we're finding them much later than intended. That said, as simple as the puzzles were, I actually really appreciate that they included a few little side things for us to do as we were just traipsing about from one long-winded conversation to the next. Which I, I honestly don't mind either. I, uh, I actually found it very fascinating meeting the new various senior bridge crew. Though I'm sure some folks will hate it. It's not exactly the most exciting way to jump into our new DLC, but... But, you know, what can I say? I appreciate good world building, and uh, I feel like these are all some pretty interesting additions to our... our colorful cast of characters. Even the one who uh, very awkwardly hit on me. Though, to be fair, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure she and the Infernus Master are inevitably going to come to blows, and we'll have to pick sides, and... I'm gonna say now, probably not gonna be her, but... I guess we'll see. Anyway, we've uh, run a bit long, so this feels like as good a place as any to call it. We'll hit the pause button for now, and uh, we will pick up here next time. As we seek out the Astropath of Least Resistance. And, you know, maybe coax a few confessionals along the way. See you then. Oh, and special thanks to the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible, including but not limited to Eerie V23, Revenant, Eloise, Dragon Matrix 7, Dragon, The Egon Altar, Excelsior, Goat League, James Tremay, Kazor, Mark Jemsa, Nathan Welch Jr., Overlord Farum, Random Passerby, Robbie B., Thomas Piedkowski, Trip Hop and Skip, and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, if you'd also like to help support the channel, then feel free to push the buttons that do the things. Trust me, it does make a difference. Or you could even check out the PayPal, the Patreon, the Nexus GG, or the YouTube memberships. Links are in the description.